Okay, so I have a story to share with you today. When I was a kid, I had invisible friends. Not imaginary, but invisible. And that's an important difference. Imaginary implies that they weren't real, whereas invisible is a matter of what you can and cannot see. When you have great aspirations, you need to be able to see what isn't yet visible. And I wanted to race sled dogs. I prepared for this dream in every way possible for a kid growing up in the Midwest. I started with a team of six sled dogs who pulled the shopping cart for me at the grocery store. In the commute to and from school, I would stare out the car window and watch my extremely fast dogs race my mom's car along the highway. I read books about dogs. I studied and drew them. And maybe most importantly, I got to know their stories and filled notebooks with them. Between the ages of 6 and 12, I grew my team to over 100 sled dogs. And then a bunch of them fell in love, retired from racing, and ran away to see the world together. So <laughs> it happens. <laughs> so I didn't grow up to be a sled dog racing champion. But what I gained from preparing to be one was much more valuable. I practiced my creativity. I learned to take what was in my head and make it with my hands. So my sled dog racing days are long over. But since then, a lot of people have told me how lucky I am to be creative. And I almost agree. I would argue that creativity isn't a bonus gene that some of us have and the rest of us don't. In fact, the origin of the word create is to make something out of nothing, which is the existence of life itself. So we're biologically programmed to need to create new things with the purpose of perpetuating life. And we see this exemplified in so many ways. For instance, we're far from being the only animals to use tools or to make things. Birds build nests, spiders spin webs, and ants build insanely intricate labyrinths underground. We're also not the only animals to use decoration, seduction, and war, right? Nature is constantly showing us just how inventive it is. So creating doesn't make us unique. But what does make us unique as human beings is beyond tool making, beyond decoration, something in us compels us to record our own image and the images and information of others in the surrounding world. No other animal does this. In our special brand of human creativity, we have found a way to bridge our understanding with others. Beyond forming something out of nothing, we actively use creativity to make new connections with the intention of establishing lasting legacies. Going back to my childhood, I knew from an early age what I loved to do. I loved making art and telling stories. And that was important because I had a highly unstable and unhappy childhood. And I know today how lucky I am to have been able to envision other realities. I safeguarded the kind of daydreaming that many adults thought was a distraction. I couldn't sit still in the classroom. But even so, without fail, Every evening, I would go to my desk and write and draw until bedtime. And every day on the playground, I would organize a group of kids around me to listen to the latest chapter of my story. I practiced a level of discipline that many adults didn't realize I had. But I wasn't supposed to do what I loved. My parents and other adults would tell me, oh, you'll never make a living doing that. Society won't respect you. You'll starve. To this day, when I tell people that I'm an artist, they'll ask, oh, for a living? Can you imagine asking any other profession that? Oh, you're a lawyer for a living? <laughs> <laughs> and I think, yeah, but more importantly, to be alive. Going back to luck, I'm not lucky because I'm creative. I'm lucky because I haven't lost it. I realized back then that none of the adults in my life were happy. Don't get me wrong, most had good intentions. My parents, who were immigrants, wanted to distance our family from the uglier parts of their history. My mom hated how women were mistreated in her family. My dad hated how the Cultural Revolution failed in China and deprived an entire generation of a proper education. Neither of my parents wanted me to repeat history. But in order to break a pattern, you need to be able to create a new one. And so often, that's what we resist doing. One of the most painful lessons of my childhood came from watching my parents relive the abuses that had traumatized both of them so badly. And while my dad didn't want me to be a suffering artist, he himself wanted to be a writer. But he worried he couldn't do it. 
that he couldn't write history. When he finally wrote his story, he was too scared to publish it, and he died before getting to really see what he could have done with it. I was 21 that year, and it was a wake-up call for me. Twice in my adolescence, I quit the arts because I thought I was being foolish or self-indulgent, and I nearly quit a third time that year. As I sorted through my dad's things, I found myself asking, who are you to think that what you have to say or make is so important? But I realized that without some vision of what we add to the world, suffering will not give way to happiness, and revolutions will not lead us to renaissance. We live in a world with too much stuff, and the U.S. especially gets accused of being a consumer culture. It's easy to wonder, what's the use of making anything? But what we make is everything. Our problem today isn't that we value stuff too much, but that we value it too little. We don't make work that lasts or is worth taking care of. And in the process of criticizing our consumerism, it's easy to forget that we have the power to create what we consume. So how did we get to this point where so many people will tell you that they're not creative? You've probably heard it, and maybe said it yourself. I'm not creative. I don't know anything about art or music or dance. What's sadder is when I hear people resolutely claim that things like the arts aren't even necessary, who say, if you want change, if you want to improve social standing, focus on the practical stuff, like engineering or accounting, the stuff that'll get you a job. But I find that sentiment dissatisfactory, because it's not an either or, and it misses some vital points. Why bother engineering something without any vision for why it should exist? Why maintain the checkbooks of the very companies that drive our inequalities? This isn't just about the arts. Creativity is about connection, and without it, we've lost our way. So my experience with loss and the questions thereafter set me on this path to try and understand the role of creativity in our survival. And having had the chance now to work across industries, I've gone to see how it operates in different settings and where it seems to hide. In 2011, I started working at a commercial printing company after leaving a job in the public school system. Immediately, I was frustrated with the wastefulness and petty office politics, knowing that just a 10-minute drive away were my students at a school that was getting gutted. Even so, I stayed and I started listening to the workforce that my students were supposed to become a part of. And I began to see the deeper insecurities that surfaced as our politics and as our waste. So if you looked at our desks, you would have seen meeting notes, spreadsheets, numbers. But if you talked to people, you would hear what they think of one another and themselves. In my last position at this company, I worked in lean process improvement. And since then, I've gone to interview lots of people across organizations. And what I've learned is this. If you ask people what they do, they'll tell you how complicated it is, how hard it would be to teach to somebody else or to automate. This is a defense tactic. People will hoard knowledge and resources if they think it'll make them invaluable or irreplaceable. And it happens on all levels. The irony is that they'll also tell you how hard it is to get the right information from anybody else. <laughs> this happens because in a society rife with social disparities, people will seek any means of self-preservation. Look at most companies and you'll see a clear divide in the roles of men and women. There's another divide where people who have college degrees work office jobs and people who don't work at a plant doing hard labor at a lower pay grade. If you're a minority, you're more likely to work in the plant. And when I would go out into the manufacturing area, some of my colleagues would regularly come up and say how nice it was to see a minority in the office because it meant maybe they had a voice or maybe they could work there too. And having spoken with various managers on this over the years who get frustrated on how to motivate people for the right reasons, I have to say, as long as inequality exists, people will fight for status and security, and it will keep getting in the way of our desire for shared purpose. When we have done so many things to disrupt our creativity, we force ourselves to seek social distinction by sex, 
race, religion, job title. We write policies to barricade rather than exchange knowledge and opportunities. We form cliques instead of networks. We see it in politics now with how polarized we are. We see it in crime and war. When people lack resources, they become resourceful in any way possible. So this is how we end up diverting and squandering our human creativity. The evidence is there that we are creative, and yet we've corrupted it. We use it to make ads instead of artwork, to find loopholes instead of designing better systems. When we devalue people's creativity, we stop them from believing that something better might be possible. And so our companies don't evolve. And so our families and cities get stuck trying to solve the same crises over and over again. But it doesn't have to be this way. The same things that divide us can bring us together. Our greater challenge is this. Can we see beyond what connects us immediately to reach what connects us more deeply? To answer this for myself, I left my last corporate job two years ago to pursue my artwork and connect it to the causes I care about. And it's been a ride, <laughs> but thus far, it's the best decision I've made. I got to work on a mural this summer with the students of Escuela Verde in Milwaukee. And I was sold on wanting to work with them when one of the teachers explained how to learn about the ecosystem, they go down by the river, they learn on site. They discuss why that river is important, not only what it has done for the city economically, but why it's enjoyable, why it's beautiful. We partnered through a nonprofit called Artists Working in Education to use public art as a way of activating a ne neglected space. We focus on immigration, which is um, an area that has a lot of triggers for people right now. Many of the students and their families are a part of Immigrant, fam um, immigrant communities, and um, tensions rise around those who have papers and those who don't. We would need a whole day to do justice to the topic of immigration. But what we know is this. Immigration isn't new. Like all others, other species, we have been nomadic in pursuit of new resources. And we have always lived in this partnership of local and global. Being rooted enables us to build communities and to establish cultures and values. Being mobile enables us to share and advance ideas and to become curious rather than wary of the unfamiliar. So our goal for this mural was to reveal the underlying partnerships of opposites. We understood that the problem isn't paperwork, but how what we decide goes on paper, shapes our reality. Could we be the ones to set a vision? We did two months of workshops, and early on, many of the students wanted to focus on the Mexico-US border. But as we collected the stories of our neighbors and classmates, our big epiphany came when some of the students shared stories of their Irish ancestors getting denied at Ellis Island and having to cross the border from Canada. Sound familiar? We're talking about stacks of generations reliving the same story. We study different plants and animals, all of which show that nobody, no life form, is purely local. We studied fractals. Somebody asked me, we're studying math in art class? And I said, yeah, and here's why. What is a fractal? A fractal is itself repeated, infinitely smaller and bigger. You draw a line. And from that, draw two more lines, and from there, two more lines, and so forth. Look at the pattern it creates. Where in nature do we see these patterns? Zoom in on a tree, and you'll see the same pattern in a leaf's veins, in how the branches split, and how the limbs of the tree fork out from the body. Now, take a moment with me, and look at the palms of your hands. What do you see? Can you see the pattern of your veins and how your fingers branch out from your hands and how your limbs branch out from your body? So this is the shared, repeated pattern that creates all the diversity that we see. 
projects like these excite me because they indicate that we're going in the right direction, that we're thinking holistically rather than compartmentally. There's other evidence of change as well, like the DIY and maker movements that are popping up all over the country. Our push to buy local shows that we want to support the people we know in our communities. Cultural groups and language schools also show that as our communities grow, we want to offer support and inclusion over exploitation. These are the proof of what we're hungry for. But we have not yet reached a tipping point. Creativity needs to be one of our core values, not just an extracurricular, and it needs to be inseparable from our value of education. We have to ask, what do we think is possible for us? What will we invest in? And whom? And why? Who will we teach to make and write history? Beyond monetary profit, what's our spiritual profit? There's a reason our free speech is so important. There's a reason that dictatorships go after the arts first, after personal expression first. If you can take or buy people's means of expression, you can control who they become. So we have to ask, not are we creative, but in what ways are we creative? How will we practice and strengthen our creativity? And what will we use it for? You don't need to be an artist. You just need to know who you are and why you're here. And if you have any doubts on how to answer that, just look at your hands and know that with those hands, you can write history for the friends you have and the ones you have yet to see. Thank you.